let me talk to you folks a little bit about drawing birds in flight. Um, there are a few kind of structural anatomical things that really help us be able to do that. And um, the, uh, <clears throat> and, and also some kind of interesting foreshortening strategies. Um, and so let's, let's take a look at, uh, hold on just a moment. Um, I'm going to share my screens with you. And uh, so we're going to first just kind of look structurally at what's going on on the bird wing. And then, then we're going to stick those onto a bird and it's going to fly around. And then we are going to um, start, you know, moving those wings at different angles. So first of all, what's it like when you're kind of flying around like that? And then what happens if each of those wings is bent? And um, how does that impact our ability to draw what we see? Some of these foreshortening things are counterintuitive. But if you know what is going on with those, then you can actually see it as that bird is circling around in front of you. By the way, birds that are circling around are great things to draw. Birds that are doing this with their wing, right? That's so blurry, our, our eye can't freeze it, our eye can't stop it. And so I've got a different strategy for drawing those, those um, sorts of birds. But let's, let's just dive in and check this out. I'm gonna share my desktop with everybody here. And all right, I'm gonna be demonstrating things over here. Hold on a second. There we go. I'm gonna be demonstrating things over here and showing you things over there. Ooh, look, it's a bird in flight. Let's check out some of these things. So, uh, as that live transmission being able. Um, uh, so uh, there's a request that to enable live transcription. Um, uh, oh, enable. <laughs> That's easy enough. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and Susie, we should uh, look into having that be uh, just sort of one of the standard things that we do. Um, thank you for that suggestion. If the words at the bottom of the screen uh, distract you, I think there is a way to turn that off. And um, somebody who knows Zoom better than me, um, please just drop a comment into the um, into the the chat, letting people know how to do that if that is a distraction. All right, so let's start with some small birds. Um, you know, here is some high speed photography of a small bird in flight, and um, some people think that you're supposed to somehow be able to see what is happening here, but it's just a little blur. So my way of handling that is you just, you, you, you draw the blur, draw the blur. So if, if, you're, if you're looking at a, um, uh, let's say there is, there, I was looking at a lot of J's earlier today and there's you know, some J that is, is flying along here. Jays are kind of in that intermediate zone. They're still kind of flapping their wings so fast you really can't see them. What I've got here is sort of a, a, the, the mass of the bird's body. And so um, they're, they're really torpedo shaped um, for being uh, streamlined through the air. So I've kind of given myself a bigger head, a little bit of bigger body. The body is bigger on this end than on this end. And then it tapers out here. And then, then you've, got, you've got a tail that sticks out like that. Um, so what you'll see is that this sort of central core part of the bird, um, that, part, um, that part will be, uh, hold on a second, I am looking through my collection of pencils here for this pencil, yes. All right, so so this um, this part that is 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 in here, you're because it is not flapping. You're going to see those parts as a little bit more still, and then over here we've got our body. It's got darker back, pale chest, 
and then I'm going to draw my tail here. Um, and then what are the wings doing? The wings across here are a great big blur. And you can even smudge them like that. Um, but you, you really don't, you, you can't pick out those, what those individual feathers are doing. So you'll kind of have a shape of, of a bird, or if there's a hummingbird um, hovering in front of you, all right, I like sort of starting with what is the angle along the back, all right, so here's my little hummingbird in flight, and sometimes they'll stick their tail up like that. Let's try that. Right, so here's a little hummingbird core in flight. So um, I'm going to be able to, they will do this sort of nice hovering thing for me. And I'm just going to add a little bit of tone onto the back, onto the head, give it a little kind of ear stripey here. This one is a uh, female, so we don't have a big gorget. But what do the, the wings do? You're going to see this blur across the body. And so what I recommend people do is look at the shape of the hummingbird wing blur. So what is the shape of the blur, not the individual feathers? And what you'll see is it will often make kind of a, an, an angular shape as when it's out here, you know, you, it goes to a wingtip, and out here it goes to a wingtip. And then again, that is, that is, that is what, where my blur is. And that's what I'm seeing. If I get some, um, and I'm gonna actually add a little bit more of a kind of a core darkness in here because sometimes up by where the wrist is, there's more. But you know that's kind of what you see, and then it's it's transparent. Um, you'll see high speed photography of hummingbirds in flight, where you'll see these you know, these little kind of all the details of the wing. They've got these little packs of secondaries, and then these long primary feathers. That you'll see all the details of those feathers, but that's. If you're drawing that, you are doing a drawing of a high-speed photography photograph, as opposed to a sketch of what you're really seeing in the field. So don't, don't feel bad that you don't have magical uh, eyes or that, that there's, there's something wrong with you that you can't see the blur. Nobody can. It is too fast for the human eye. However, bigger birds soar. The smaller you are, your relationship to air is different, and you, you, you really, it's, it's, it's hard to soar. Um, the bigger wings you get, the more, uh, and, and the bigger your body, the more soaring becomes a practical way of going through the air, which means you're gonna be not, the wings will be changing position as the bird moves to different angles, but it's not gonna be doing this. So, um, oh, look at how that makes the whole thing blurry. That time I did. Um, so let's take a look at, uh, at just a little bit of anatomy of the wing. I'm gonna divide the wing into three core parts. The tip of the wing out here is what's called the primary feathers, this dark area. And notice that these fan. So if you are taking notes, Raybanto is, I suggest you do too, right? Um, here's kind of a, a, a simplified wing diagram. Um, I am going to have, um, actually, whoop, ah. um, there's a little bird hand in here. That goes back to a little bird elbow and to a little birdie shoulder. So that's anatomically what is going on underneath the wing. And on the hand here, um, 
the feathers of the primaries, they all um, come in and connect to the hand. So you see how that makes a fan? So those are all coming to this little corner here. Sometimes, you know, if you, you, you can, th they actually all attach along a hand like that, but you know, it's, it's not going to be too much of a stretch to um, just sort of, you know, get your lines just sort of pointing to the same corner there. If you want to be really precise, um, you, can, you can sort of pay attention to th that they would be going, you know, just a millimeter apart but you don't really need to do that. So they're all pointing towards that part there. Notice that there's something going on a little bit differently out here in these primary feathers. These are all primary feathers, but these ones you're seeing dung, 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 these, these little sort of finger look. That's because the tips of those feathers, the feathers themselves have a shape like this. And so there's this notch and imagination in it that means that the tips are skinnier than the rest of it. And that means that in this area out here, you are sometimes going to see this as looking more fingery. Right? And, but, and pointing towards this corner. And then they continue to point towards the corner as you go down here, but they're not fingery here. So we're not drawing the wing like this. All right, so that's fingers all the way down, right? So if you are getting fingering in your wing, that's gonna be out in this wedge here. And then the secondary feathers attach to this bone here, and those are coming straight down off that bone here. So these ones tend to line up. These ones here tend to fan. So the primary feathers fan, the secondary feathers stack. Let's take a look at what happens when that wing starts to close. So pay attention first to the primary feathers. Those are the dark ones out here. Notice that as the wing closes, those, just like folding up a fan, they all stack up on top of each other. And that then swings down and tucks underneath the secondary feathers. These are the secondary feathers here. These are the ones that stack. Notice that they're roughly parallel with each other. They're roughly parallel with each other. They're roughly parallel with each other, roughly par parallel with each other, and roughly parallel with each other. The more they get closed up, the more of a pattern these first three that are little bear, mama bear, and, and papa bear. So there's these sort of three bears of, of, uh, of, of feathers in the end getting progressively larger. And in the really folded up wing, those are a really prominent part of the pattern that you see in the secondary feathers. The other thing you notice on the secondary feathers is that uh, this is more something that we pay attention to when we are drawing the folded up wing. But see those wing bars? Those are if the tips of these first couple of rows of feathers in what are called the coverts here, which are these feathers that cover up the front edge of the wing. <clears throat> um, if those have little white bars on them, then you see little white wing bars. And those make very crisp little lines when you fold that wing all the way up. For general wings in flight, what I'm thinking about is there's this fan part, there is the parallel part, and then there are these coverts up above that cover up the front edge of the wing. So I'm gonna just put that into this part here. There are coverts over the primaries called primary coverts, and there are coverts over the secondaries called the secondary coverts. And um, that covers up that portion of the wing. The final thing I'm gonna point out in wing structure is that the next little piece in here, there's a little pad of feathers over the bird's shoulder. You can see that right here. Those are called the scapular feathers. They're over the bird's shoulder blade or scapula. You see them here, you see them here, you see them here, you see them here. Um, that 
but sort of being aware that there's that little pad of feathers up there can often help you kind of blend your wing into the body. All right. So here again, we are seeing primaries and secondary feathers. These weird kind of long feathers out here are those one, two, three feathers, those uh, that we saw on that stack of primaries, I mean, of secondary feathers um, on a duck wing. This is a, a little duck wing. Those are, are, are longer. And then finally, just pointing out the scapular feathers, notice this little pad of feathers in here, this little pad of feathers in here, that those are going to kind of be right there at the intersection for where you stick your wing into the body. There's going to be a little pad of feathers to meet it there. So looking at this wing here, out here at the tip, I have primaries to about here. I have secondary feathers coming back here. And then these are the coverts, primary coverts, secondary coverts, and my pile of scapulars. I'm going to just make a little wing diagram down here because it's useful. Here I have my secondaries. Here I have my primaries. I have a pad of feathers over my the back here, that's my scapulars. On the front edge of the wing here, I have my primary coverts. And here I have my secondary coverts. If you can look at a wing and kind of break it down that way in your head, you are way ahead of the curve. Go to the front of the class. Um, very nice white scapulars on a red tailed hawk. Little out of place feather there. The ones are probably about to, in the process of dropping out and being shed, molted. But take a look at this. Can you pick out primaries, secondaries, primary coverts, secondary coverts, and those scapulars? Try it on that bottom one. How'd that go? Primaries, primary coverts. Secondaries, secondary coverts, and my scapulars. One last little detail I'm going to add to the wing here. This is for um, this is for the people who've been drawing birds for a while. There is there's one other little kind of weird set of wing of uh, feathers that is right here and right here. These are deployed in slow, high-performance flight. So this Harris Hawk is coming in for a landing. And right here at the wrist, these little pads of feathers have popped up. You see here with these peregrines flying around, they're kind of doing some tricks with each other as they're doing that. You're seeing this extra tooth out there on the front edge of the wing. That's because these birds are flying slowly. They're getting more drag. They've popped up this little wing called the bastard wing or the allula. And um, that you often will see when you know, the birds are doing some cool kind of in-flight tricks. So you'll get that as an extra little pad of feathers out there. But, um, and here, this wing's about to land, this one's about to land. Um, so you'll sometimes will see these on the, the, the wings stick out. Don't be confused if you see that. It's not like there's an extra horn here. That little pad of feathers is actually attached to the bird's thumb. So this little pad of thumb feathers that they're sticking out in high performance club. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, Peter Cavanaugh has just arrived. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I am really... Uh, excited to uh, hold on a second I am not able oh oh I can move this around um, I am there we go um, uh, thank you so much for for being with us today um, the um, so uh, Peter Cavanaugh is uh, an amazing photographer who does high 
um, high speed photography of the positions of, 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 of bird's wings in flight. And also is really interested in the ecology and, and natural history of, of the birds. You recently published a book um, with some of your, a um, hundred of your most amazing uh, bird in flight photographs. Um, it is absolutely exquisite. Um, and uh, I've, I've asked Peter if he would come on and share some of his photography with us um, as, as, as well as some of the kind of, the, there's, there's interesting you know, backstories behind all these different critters. And um, then um, I'm going to also be using some of those, photog those, those photographs that Peter is showing to help us get some of the, the nuance of, um, of, of what we're seeing into our drawings. Um, uh, Peter, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, John, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm sorry to be late. Um, our, uh, we hadn't exchanged emails beforehand, and I'm afraid it got past me. So uh, I had a couple of alternate dates on my calendar, and I'm, I'm glad we're together now. Uh, I, I think that I, I can take full responsibility for that. Um, I am a terrible logistics person and thought that I, ha I had done that. Sometimes I've got things sitting in my... I'm about to send this this email uh, you know, file I that, that I think have gone out, and um, I am uh, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to put you in that that awkward situation. If if you'd prefer, we can reschedule, um, or we can just kind of continue from here. What would be the most comfortable for you? From Um, I, I'm, I'm not hearing, um, I think we've got, oh, could you please repeat that? I think we just had a little glitch in our internet connection. Okay, let, let's, uh, let's continue on today, John. Excellent. And, and again, I'm so grateful for you uh, coming and joining the, 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 the community here. So um, I'm not quite sure where you are in the in the class today, but um, perhaps I'll just choose a, a few examples, uh, and you can then add the uh, the, the drawing part of it. So I, I'm going to. This is the book. It's called, as John said, "A Hundred Flying Birds," and uh, I'm going to just piece through here and choose a few images that I like and. Um, we will uh, we will go from there. So the book is organized by chapters and um, the first chapter is on eagles and to illustrate a few different things. So let's choose um, a local bird. I, I live on Lopez Island, by the way, in the uh, in the San Juan Islands. And so um, I'm going to choose, let me, before I share the screen, let me find the picture. And this, this, the, the, for, for folks who don't know this, this book has just got some exquisite um, uh, photography of, of, of birds and I want to encourage people to, um, if you're looking for bird reference material to kind of help you understand um, how birds work, this, pick up a copy of this uh, book, absolutely gorgeous work. It takes a lot of expertise to kind of get these, these moments. All right, so I'm just pulling up the first image and uh, let's get that full screen and I'll come back now and share my screen. So uh, I am, I must say, obsessed by bald eagles. Um, we have a lot of bald eagles uh, on the island here and I really can't stop uh, shooting them. And um, whenever I see I can see some eagle perches from my uh, uh, fr from my my uh, kitchen or from my dining room, and whenever I see that telltale signature white head, I, I get out there with the camera and um, I, I take images of them. And this is an interesting image in, in a number of ways because it uh, it shows a feature of uh, bird flight which also reflects on the anatomy and you'll notice that the feathers on both wings look like slats in a venetian blind 
And this bird has just taken off from a high perch into a fairly strong wind. And it has had one downstroke to, to try and get some height. And this is its first recovery stroke, the top of its first recovery stroke. So um, this is a thing that ornithologists call wingtip reversal, where you see the gaps between the primary feathers. And um, the eagle has 10 primary feathers, and they're the ones that are rotated. And um, what's very interesting about this anatomically is that the, the feathers are not controlled individually by muscles. They are controlled rather like the way a Venetian blind is controlled. They're, they're controlled by uh, the, the patagium. Um, and it, when it pulls, it rotates all of the feathers together. So uh, you get this result of, uh, of a rotated pattern uh, like this. Uh, I also like the way the eagle is a little bit off balance to the left. It, it adds a sense of dynamism uh, to the image. So that's that's the first image. John, you have any any comments on that? Anyway, yeah. To go on. That one? Just I, I, I just want to show some people just using this this photograph. I want to show people kind of how you can use a photograph like this to kind of help you kind of wrap your head around these things. Photographs are such great tools for understanding um, the positions of, of, of birds' feathers in flight. Um, on your screen, you'll notice that between the image of uh, the eagle on the left and the, the, um, the uh, Peter's face and my face, there's a small vertical white bar. If you put your mouse on that, you can drag it to the left. I don't think that works on some tablets. But if you're working on, say, a, 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 a PC, you can drag that to the left and make our heads bigger or the eagle bigger. So you can resize those things. I'm going to suggest for just for a moment, move it to make our heads bigger. And what I'm going to do is um, I am going to, um, I'm just going to sort of, you know, show some thoughts about how you might go about um, recording that image in your journal. And hold on a second. <clears throat> I'm going to lower my camera. There we go. All right. So what I would, would, would do with something like this is you've got, you've got sort of the, the body of the eagle in the, the middle of, of the picture. But I, here I'm really focused on these wings. And um, what, what I'm seeing is that I have the, the two wings up like this. So this is the bird's wrist right up here. And it has its wings folded in such a way that the primary feathers significantly overlap the secondaries. And so you really don't see those very well. So the primary feathers are uh, out in a, in a pile like that. The secondaries are kind of tucked underneath them. On this wing here, the secondaries are tucked in here. The primaries, so I'm, I'm just sort of drawing a big kind of box um, out, out here. Uh, sort of showing where those those primaries are and again the wrist is up in here so those feathers are directed down like that right um, so just something that's neat to see on this is that this if the wing is bent up the surface that is the secondaries which is a big zone of wings on this photograph appears as just this small little slot here and um, and so that kind of helps you understand the structure of what you're seeing. So I would probably diagram it in my, my head, something like this. I would notice to myself that this portion here, I'm not seeing as much of the imagination fingering. So that means I then have these Venetian blinds coming out here. And as we get down into here, I'm seeing less of that. Um, one advantage of this, of, of kind of mechanically why the bird is doing this, is that on the upstroke, 
if you have your the if the air can easily pass between your feathers, then um, your wing goes up easily. You um, turn them so they make a nice big flat surface, and then on your downstroke, they're pushing air. So it's a good way. If if they were if they stayed shut, then on the upstroke you'd push air, and that'd push you down. Right? Um, but that's an absolutely gorgeous picture. Um, I'm now on my uh, camera going to slide um, it back so that the photograph is now kind of up front and center. And let's join Peter again for um, a, another look at uh, photographs that inspire him. So I'm going to stay with the eagle motif here, and I'm going to go to a photograph where it's not just the bird that is the, uh, oh, excuse the uh, very needy dog that is in, in the room. I, I, if I get rid of him, it'll be even worse. So. No worries, no worries. We're, we're pet friendly. Yeah. So um, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, um, um, I really have to shut this dog up just a moment. Hey, come here, come here, come here. It's okay, puppy. It's okay, puppy. Sometimes our doggos just need a little more attention. Okay, I've sort of got him closer now, and hopefully. Yeah, I really like your metaphor of the Venetian blinds, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, so, so now um, I'm going to go to. Um, uh, a very interesting bird called a, a battler eagle. It's uh, an eagle in Africa. And in this particular photograph, it isn't just the, um, so here I'll go to stop the share and then I'll go and share again. So uh, hold on a moment, please. Here we go. So in this photograph, um, certainly the the landing eagle is a uh, a very interesting target, but this wonderful old leadwood tree that he is landing on, I think, also adds some substance and interest to the photograph. These leadwood trees are. Uh, there are many of them in Africa, and when they die, they are so hard that they say they stay standing for uh, it's said to be up to a hundred years. And uh, I'm, I'm sure John, you have seen these in your travels in Africa. And so, we've got a gray backdrop. We've got the the female battler on the left uh, watching her mate do his landing routine so uh, it's it's a certainly a, a different kind of shot from the last one where the bird is not just the focus of the image but the uh, the tree also adds um, a very interesting dimension so i was talking while muted um, there are a lot of parallels to what we do with nature journaling where we find that kind of putting the context of what we're we're drawing into our sketches um, makes makes a huge huge difference. Um, so sometimes we'll draw little inset sketches, which you know give you a sense of of that. Um, want to um, use this drawing just to, to point out another kind of interesting feature of of bird wings that often confuses people and uh, gives us some challenges in our sketches. Um, on that little battler eagle that is coming in from the right, um, look at the thickness or the width of the two wings. The one in the back seems to be um, a deeper wing. That's because it is rotated. It is foreshortened. And you often will see that in as you're drawing birds of flight. But in our heads, in our brains, um, our brains don't want to draw those wings different uh, widths because, <laughs> because we know that they're, they're, that they're the same. It's bilaterally symmetrical. Um, but if you know that that's a common thing, that, uh, then that will help you be able 
to draw what you see. So if you enlarge the image portion of this, um, then what um, you're going to see is as I sketch this, you know, here's I'm just putting in a little oval for where my, my, my body is, a little head is going to be up there. I'm not too much worried about those at this point. But I have one wing that comes off here. I have another wing that is coming up. And or so you see at the wrists there, there are these sort of changes in angle. Now, here's the, 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 the hard part of drawing this is that I'm going to be making the depth, the, 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 the width of these um, different. So I like to, uh, hold on, my pencil is breaking on me. Um, so the one that is close to me, I'm going to give this a narrow rectangle. And then it fans out to here. And the one that is further away from me, um, that is a deeper, a, a, a wider rectangle coming down there. And so there is sort of how my brain would kind of think about these. Um, it is hard to get your, it, our, our brains want to put symmetry in all parts of drawings where we know that there is symmetry. Um, but just knowing that all I have to do is take this big wide wing and turn it at a slightly different angle and all of a sudden it appears narrow. Um, and that is, uh, then I'm going to be able to kind of get this 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 look into it now again out here I've got my fanning feathers and then on my close one I have the same my covert feathers are the the covert feathers on the upper surface of the wing on the secondaries are white but they're black on the primaries. So that gives you sort of a black part and a white part on the wing. And the covert feathers on the primaries and the secondaries um, are both white on the underside of the wing. But getting this one to be, giving yourself permission to make this wing not as wide as that other one is kind of a, a, a mental hurdle that you'll you'll have to, to get through. Last thing on drawing a little um, kind of context sketch like this, if in your notebook, if in your journal, you had this sort of detailed drawing of this bird coming in, um, you're missing a big part of the moment. So this is where little inset sketches are so nice. You can just give yourself a little tiny box and in that, um, you can show, you know, here's, here's this, you know, crazy kind of branch that comes up. Sometimes as you're drawing things like this, if you just look at the, um, uh, up, up at the tree as you're making your sketch, rather than your paper, you can do, you sometimes those drawings come out just a little bit better. This pencil is no longer working for me. Um, so having, you know, just a, a little sketch that kind of gives you a sense of, you know, this kind of cool moment with your, your, your tree in it, having that in your, um, field notes will really help bring back the details of any moment. I really like your sense of composition too, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, so now I suggest to maximize the photograph part of this, and we're good. All right.
Um, so I'm, I'm hearing from some folks that it is difficult to see um, what I'm drawing in a tiny window. Um, so on, on, people's, um, on people's computers, if you're watching this live, it's hard to do this um, on, the, on the recording, you won't be able to do it. Um, but see if you can drag the portion of the screen with our, um, our portraits to be larger. And then um, that will allow you to see those. What was the name of this tree again? A leadwood tree. Leadwood tree. Mm. Beautiful. What is another one of your um, photographs that uh, inspires you, that you particularly find interesting? Well, let's go to hummingbirds because hummingbirds are always um, fascinating birds to, uh, to to look at and to paint and um, and to draw. And we've got an interesting hummingbird um, called Kopke's hummingbird. Um, it is. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have to trim it just a little bit to get it in. It was taken in Peru, and it has a very interesting history. It was named for a woman ornithologist, which is very rare. Um, ornithology tends to have been uh, very much a sexist discipline for many years. It was only something that men did, or was said to be so. Um, and um, I'll be with you in just a minute. And, and this um, particular one uh, has a uh, so here we come. Um, so stop that. And we'll go back to share. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the woman after this is named after, who this is named after, actually was tragically killed in a, in a plane crash. And her daughter survived a 10,000 foot fall into the forest, which is wow. pretty amazing. Wow. Um, she was various movies have been made about it and she was actually mentioned in the new york times last year but anyway here's the hummingbird it's a kopke's hummingbird and um i i like the dynamic nature of this hummingbirds are masters of sort of turning on a dime and there are several uh things about this image that show you that this bird is in the the process of a void making rapid maneuvers. Uh, most interestingly, you'll notice that the wings are very much morphed from their usual shape and that at this moment, that right wing is clearly traveling backwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about hummingbirds, of course, is that they generate lift both on the forward stroke and the backward stroke and they generate about 30 40 percent of of their lift on a backstroke it's not equal it's more on the forward stroke but uh, uh, and, and by the way what looks like a scratch on the uh, the photograph by the tail is actually a cobweb that this bird is carrying oh so, uh, there's a lot of interesting features uh, to this particular picture yeah oh that is really neat <clears throat> There, there is a, a also kind of a from a, a from a sketcher's perspective. Um, there's there's an interesting feature of this um, of this wing that um, I, I I can also point out. So the the body of this hummingbird is at an angle, little head up. Um, and I've got one wing that is roughly coming out up here. I've got one wing that is roughly coming out down here. But as the birds are, hummingbirds are, are flapping their wings, they actually take their wing and on the downstroke, the bottom of it is, um, uh, the bottom of their wing points down. But when they come back on the other stroke, they actually turn their wing over. So their wing is doing a little flip 
in flight. And so this is actually mid flip. And the result is, a, so they're doing a figure eight pattern with the wing. And you can also see a figure eight pattern in the wing itself. So if you look, there is a, um, you can sort of think of the wing that is closer to you as being uh, a, hold on, there we go. There's, there's a figure eight in that, that you can, if you sort of imagine that figure eight continuing behind um, where you see the top surface of the wing, this all being the top surface of the, the, the wing, you can sort of see how that continues here. So there's a little, one way of visualizing this is a loop. So essentially there's a loop that we have in the edge of the wing. And then from the back edge of that, part of that is, 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 is covered up. So here is the top surface of the wing. And then you're seeing this little part here is a little bit of the under surface of the wing there. And then on the other side, I need to make my wing big again. Um, actually, um, I'm, um, may I interrupt for a quick second to say, um, some folks have pointed out that if we turn off our video cameras, then the internet feed might work better for Mr. Kavanaugh. So if people wouldn't mind please um, turning off their cameras, um, that will help him. And also we had a question about what was the name of that movie again um, that you were talking about earlier? Yes, I'll find the name of the movie for you in just a moment. Uh, I see in the chat, Susie wrote in Wings of Hope, 1998. Oh, well done. Um, yeah, we've got, we, we've got a, 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 a team in the background here. Um, so I'm also getting a figure eight pattern in the other wing. So I want to think of that other wing as, as a figure eight pattern. And in this case, I am seeing in here, um, in this par portion of the wing, um, part of the under surface of the wing, and then attached to that, um, you're seeing the uh, the top surface of the wing sticking out in here. So again, a way of of, of thinking about this wing that's doing this little flip over is to give yourself sort of start off with a little loop and um, and if you can sort of envision those lines that that really helps you be able to to to, to draw what you see here mm. Now you've got this thing right in the middle of that, that wing doing the turnover. So you're seeing the underside and the top side of both of those wings. So that's really a, an, an, an interesting shot. Let's, is there another one uh, from your collection that you find particularly interesting? Um, let's open uh, this one. Uh, hold on a second. I'll just bring that up. And I'll stop that share and start another one. It's lovely to see your sketches, by the way. I have to say, I, I, I never see anything other than the photograph, but to, to see your, photo, your your sketches and the insights they give is, is really lovely. Well, um, it's, it's just another way of, of thinking about, about the, the, the work. The, the photography that you do, um, the work that you do when you're out in the field, it makes you really slow down and pay attention and to look really hard. Um, and journaling like we do is a very kind of similar sort of thing that our process slows us down 
and gets us to look again and to look again and to look again. Also, I'm sure that a big part of your process is after you've taken the, the, the photograph, the, the cropping, the editing, the post-processing, that extra bit of attention, I'm sure that's also when you notice things like, oh my gosh, this one is dragging a spider web behind it. Um, right. Yes, the, the, um, when you're shooting birds in flight, the composition is mostly done in post-processing. You don't have the luxury of being able to do the kind of composition you would when taking a portrait of a bird. So, uh, yes, it's very much a um, uh, it's it's very much a uh, a, a post processing thing. So, now, um, there's just sort of a quick note: there is some there's some interesting research on people who are just taking snapshots, which is different than what a photograph a photographer does. You're not just out there taking snapshots of things and then every once in a while they show up on your Instagram feed. Um, you're being really deliberate in the field and then deliberate in post-production. And that process really helps you pay attention and remember things more vividly. The research, uh, which we've talked about before, where there is a reduction in somebody's memory of an experience if they're taking photographs, really is about the people who are taking snapshots. And that's different than the process that, that Peter is involved in, where both in the field, you're paying deep attention, and then in post-production, really paying attention to the nuance and details of the, of the pictures. So what, to you, really stands out about this one? So this is a, um, a yellow leg girl um, taken from a ferry boat uh, going to the island of Tessel in, uh, in, Amst in, in, in the Netherlands. And uh, this bird um, is in a near stall condition. And you can tell that by the fact that the feathers, uh, both the, uh, the flight feathers and the covert feathers are incredibly ruffled, which means that there is a lot of turbulent air underneath and over the wings here. And what this bird was in the, the process of doing was flying up alongside the boat and hoping to catch a meal from the, uh, the passengers who were tossing little bits of bread. And so the, uh, the girl's goal was to remain stationary with respect to the, uh, respect to the moving ferry. And in doing so, he had he of what a wing looks like when it is usually see it uh, that is being covered in lamina smooth flows but when it's turbulent uh, because the bird is in almost a stall condition so it's it's rather unusual from that point of view yeah and i, I it's also interesting to see that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, um, as those secondaries are curving in towards you, um, by the motion of those, you can tell that this is starting to kind of flap its wings back out. Um, there are, are some really kind of useful things for us to note as, as illustrators in looking at this. There's some great anatomical lessons that we can draw from this. Also, it looks like there's some bird, been some bird biologists out in your area. Somebody put a ring on the leg of that gull. Um, so it's been banded. Right. Um, let me point out just a couple of interesting things. As I look at this gull, um, <clears throat> here's what really stands out for me. Um, I'm thinking about the anatomy of this bird. Um, so I've got a skull, and my skull is kind of looking down this direction. Um, I'm not able to tell exactly where its spine is going, um, but I'm going to kind of just rough in a kind of hot dog shape here for where the body is. And I'm going to put, um, I am going to put uh, some 
curving lines across that like this, just to kind of help my brain remember that this is a rounded form. So here's my, the mass of my body. But where the, the, the interesting anatomy for me really starts is when I start to sort of figure out what is going on with this bird's um, wings and, and the structure of that. And be, as you said, because the wings are really bent um, and some of these feathers are fluffed up, it gives you this sort of insight into what is going on there. First of all, um, so the birds have, um, it's got shoulders in roughly where I'm drawing these little, these little balls. And from the shoulder, the forearm um, comes out to an elbow. And on the other side, the forearm is pointing away from you, so it's foreshortened. So I've got a short forearm here, I've got a long forearm here. Now let's go to this, this far side here. Actually, I'm going to put my forearm down at a different angle. All right, so there's a foreshortened forearm. It is going up to a wrist. Um, and you, so you see it goes up to a little bump. And then there is a section in here that's kind of flat, with some feathers sticking out. And then you're seeing more sort of wing coming up in this direction. This little zone in here is the bird's hand. So elbow, or shoulder, elbow, wrist, and that's the bird's hand. So its primary feathers are attached on that hand in a triangle occupying roughly that area there. So the, these feathers are coming in and attaching along that hand. Um, where the, uh, from there, the secondary feathers are coming down um, and they're actually doing this, this really kind of cool uh, flip in. So the, the back edge of it here, there's, you're sort of seeing this little uh, inversion. But now there's, there's going to be, I want to point out, three really cool things. So number one, what are the secondary feathers doing? The secondary feathers are coming in and they're attaching to the forearm here, down like that. And, but now there's this big space between the body and the secondary feathers. And if you look on the photograph, there's some feathers in here. So if those are my primary feathers, and these are my secondary feathers, what on earth is going on in here? And there are two things. Um, and the, the, the first is that on this bird, you can actually see another set of feathers that attaches to the bird's humerus. So the humerus is the upper arm right in here. And on, as you get into longer winged birds, this section of humeral feathers gets longer and longer and longer and more prominent. So if you're looking at, um, say, a frigate bird um, in flight, well, I'm going to just put a frigate bird in flight up on the screen. Frigate bird in flight, where are you? Um, where's a frigate bird in flight when you need one? Um, hold on just a second. There we go. So on, on this bird here, um, these are primary feathers. These are secondary feathers in here. 
These feathers right in here, in this part of the wing, those are humeral feathers attaching to the bird's humerus. You only really see these in long-winged birds, but the, the shortest ones that you can ever kind of get to see are actually in gulls. Um, is it possible to get that gull back? Yeah, sorry, I was just teeing up the next image. Let me get him back, coming up. Um, hold on a second. I didn't realize that I was taking it off, so I'm going to have to just... Uh, there, he, there he goes. So what I've got here is I have some humeral feathers that are sticking out in here and you normally don't get to really see this on birds so this is a this is a special really cool thing that you're able to see on peter's uh and this this, this sort of moment of, of of photography where you're sort of seeing this where the, the the primary the secondary feathers come down we're seeing a little pad of humeral feathers the other thing which we're seeing in those photographs is remember how the scapular feathers on the back of the bird, um, the scapular feathers cover up the shoulder on the back. Birds also have armpit feathers um, called axillary feathers. And so this gall, you can see it's got some axillary feathers right down in here in this gap. And those help kind of smooth this in here. So this, this <clears throat> gall photograph if we're able to, to, to see it again, we might not be able to get it up again, but that, that's, that's okay if we don't. Um, the, uh, you can I, get... I thought I had it up, Don. Uh, look, I, I had it up. Let me go back and, and bring it up again. Um, okay. Um, here we go. Green, and here's the bird. Do you have it now? Yes, 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 yes. All right. So um, I'm seeing... Um, in this, I'm seeing, um, I'll draw on sort of where I'm actually seeing actual ax axillary feathers. So I'm seeing in here kind of my, my humerals coming down in a little block, right? And that's, that's really, really fun for me because that's not something that we usually get to see. And then we also have, uh, you, you're seeing some in this area where you're talking about where there's sort of some extra drag, these axillary feathers <coughs> are really fluffed up and kind of uh, filling up some of the space right in there in that little armpit. Um, so that just gives us a little bit more um, anatomical understanding. Um, and on a wing, on a photograph that is as high resolution as this, um, it, it really helps us be able to, to see those details. So axillary feathers, humerals, secondaries, primaries. Um, and then, of course, most of the, the primaries and the secondaries are covered up by covert feathers in the photograph. So this zone in here, it's all coverts, coverts, and then you can see some of the primaries, some of the secondaries, and those humerals. Um, that is, th this photograph is just a, a lesson in bird anatomy. Awesome. Um, um, and uh, Mary, I have actually I have no idea how it's spelled because I'm I'm dyslexic, and so my spelling is a little bit all over the map. Um, but somebody else in our group might be able to spell axillary for us. Um, uh, Axel uh, is a, a general term for armpit. Um, so, and let's um, want to be sort of aware of time. Let's take a look at. Um, two of your other favorite photographs, ones that you think um, that, that you would really like to, to share with uh, the, 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 the community. Thank you so much for putting the, the gall back up. This one is it's just a lesson in anatomy. Good. I'm glad you like it. Um, yeah, I'm going to put up now... Um... A lovely bird called a, a black-tailed godwit and this bird is a long-distance migrant i'm going to stop my share for a moment and <laughs> i'm just going to bring it up it typically flies four to five thousand miles in uh in a stretch as it's migrating 
uh, was actually taken in Iceland. Uh, yeah, I'll just be right with you. So you also migrate around to uh, find all these birds. That is one wonderful yes. thing about uh, an interest like this is that it pulls you to some of the far reaches of the planet. Yes, exactly, as, as these birds do in their movements. So um, I'm going to start by reading you the uh, text that I had for this picture. Um, so let's see. Uh, here we go. And now I'm going to share it. <laughs> Stunning so I, photograph. I about, this, about this picture that if I were the judge, the black tailed godwit would get my vote in the avian concours d'elegance. <laughs> this pair in full breeding plumage are, are showing off their long javelin bill that flows smoothly from slender chestnut necks. The black and white of the wing stripe and tail and the trailing undercarriage. Wait, 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 hold on. We, we lost you. Uh, we, we, we lost our. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, Peter, I'm going to interrupt for just a moment. We lost a uh, connection there when you said undercarriage. So if we could pick up from undercarriage, we're good. Yes. The black and white of the wing stripe and tail and the trailing undercarriage complete an exquisite design. They are also fast, attractive flyers with high frequency wing beats. These birds flew erratic circles around us, landing frequently to, florid, to forage, plunging their bills full length into the soft, moist undergrowth mm. or under the water. So there they are, a pair of black-tailed godwits. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, what stunning birds. Stunning birds. Now, on, uh, and also your, your writing really uh, gives me a, a, a sense of, of, of being there. It's obvious that you were, you were moved and inspired being in the presence of these incredible birds. Um, yeah, hmm. I truly was. So let's just think about if I were to draw these, what do I want to notice what do I want to notice um, that is going to help me be able to get these, these shapes onto my piece of paper? And um, as um, let's take a, first a look at that bottom wing. Trace your finger along the front edge. You can see it goes from the shoulder back towards an elbow, and then there's up to that sort of mountain of the wrist, which is dark on that bottom bird. And then out long curve to the tip of the primaries. And then we see those primaries fanning back. We see the secondaries coming back in a stack, and we don't really see any humerals here. Now take a look at that same wing on the bird above it. It is foreshortened towards you. So the whole shape of the wing gets compressed. But there's a, also a little thing going on where that bird is in a, either a slight downstroke at that moment or um, just the air is rushing up past those wingtips because the wingtips on that close wing are pushed up a little bit. And that's why that wingtip has that funny little shape. So you see how the, you would imagine if you were to foreshorten the shape of that one that is coming towards you on the bottom, it would just make you know, a smaller spike. But this one seems to have an extra turn in it. And that's because that wingtip is then pushed up by the, the, the air. So if I were to, make a diagram of these two birds to help me be able to, to sketch it. On the lower bird, this one is going to be more straightforward. 
I am going to give myself a sort of a, a, a line through the, the core of the body of the bird. Um, I have a little, its head, its neck is tucked in a little bit more, giving it more of a chesty look. So you notice how the bottom one looks more chesty than the one above. That's because the top one has its head extended. Um, and uh, so then I've got sort of my, my mass of my body. Um, I like to draw a little line down the middle of the back, um, which on this bird will be closer to the top side. Um, I have a tail sticking out, feet hanging out below that. But let's figure out now how do I handle these wings? So I want to notice where, um, where does that, 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 that front wing kind of come down? I like to kind of look at the, the front edge of the wing and it comes out and then down. I want to make sure that this point where I have the tip of the wing, if I trace that up into the body, is it roughly in the right place? And here it is. So I've got roughly got a, a line that comes back towards the elbow up towards the wrist. There's the zone where the hand is. And then we um, come down from there. I'm going to make a curved line, sort of suggesting the airfoil of the wing, um, where the primaries and the secondaries meet. I have my secondary feathers and I have my primary feathers that notice how they kind of come out to this just a nice neat point here. If the wingtip wasn't flipped up, then if I were to foreshorten this, I would get something like this, right? Where there's, there, there'd be a front edge coming down and you, 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 there'd just be this angle here would be broader, but it would be just this same thing pushed over. That's not what we're seeing up above. Let's now handle the top wing on this bird. And what you're seeing is you're seeing its wrist up above there, and the rest of that wing is just out of your line of sight. Now, for the second bird, I'm going to give myself a little body. Um, I'm going to give myself a little body. I have one wing that is coming towards you. And so how am I going to handle that? Well, <clears throat> I have uh, the secondaries are essentially going to be a, a, a rectangle block pointing out towards me. The primaries, if the wingtip wasn't pointing up towards me, the primaries would just be a little point out like that. You see, I'd just be taking that whole wing and squishing it down. But, oh, actually, um, wing tips are longer, so it would be like this. So it would just be a, if this wing tip were not flipped up, it would just be a little shape like that. But because those wing tips are shaped or tipped up, this part here, it looks almost as if it's snipped off. And that's what gives this wingtip that is coming towards you, that weird shape. Then the back side, that overall wing just appears a little bit shorter than the, the one in the front. That's because it's just rocked a little bit away from you. Here's a little trick that I like to do. Um, I will often just sort of draw a little line between the front of the wing, the back of the wing, where's the point of the tip of the wing, 
and that's going to get help me on this other wing be able to get it to be roughly the right size. And I am, if this wingtip point top was in here, um, that means this back one is gonna be in here. And I'm gonna come along here. So this, the wings on this upper bird, um, because of that wingtip flip up, that's what gives you this extra little sort of weird moment in here. Um, other things just to, to, to remember, um, this uh, wing here, because the wing is kind of curved and it's it's not just like a flat piece of paper. It's a curved thing. So it's just curved out of our field of view. And um, getting some of those angles will help you be able to draw something like this in the field. Again, I really recommend drawing birds in flight, both from life, but also from a bunch of photographs. From a bunch of photographs. Because they will help you sort of see these sort of weird kind of like, what's going on with that weird wingtip? And they'll allow you just to sort of slow down and kind of like, oh, that's where there's, there's something really kind of strange going on there. Um, Peter, I, uh, that's an absolutely beautiful photograph. And I can tell that you are just moved by being in the presence of those animals. Yeah, it was very special, very special. And let's. Well, do we have uh, time for one more? We have we time have for. Birds? Let's let's choose one more bird, um, one that that you particularly love, and um, we'll spend some quality time with that, and then have a, a little bit of time for some questions. Um, okay. We're going to have to close up shop at noon today, um, okay. and which will give us a little bit of time for people to. Hope you don't mind being peppered with questions from an enthusiastic audience. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, so this is a photograph that uh, is very early on um, in my uh, my time of photographing birds, and it was taken from a a boat on the Chobe River in uh, Botswana. And let me. Uh, bring it up and here it is and then I'll just crop it <clears throat> hold on a second please Where in Botswana were you? Uh, this was uh, just inside uh, the, the, the border. Hold on just one second and let me fill it on, fill it on screen. Um, here we go at, at a, a camp uh, at the Chobe camp on the, the Chobe River. Um, and um, here we, here we go, and I'll tell you a little bit about the photograph before we get to it. So, so this is a, another anatomy lesson for, for sure. This is a um, this is a, a glossy ibis landing, and I'll just read you a little bit from the story in the book along with that. Uh, Australian photographer Trent Park once remarked that light turns ordinary into the magic mm. in its usual incarnation the glossy ibis is just another ordinary if someone handsome bronze bird pursuing its day job of foraging along the river bank but in this image the bird is transformed into a magical being by brilliant 
African morning light illuminating its metallic green and purple plumage. The setting was equally dramatic. A low tune boat moving slowly over the river. The breath of gape hippopotamuses hanging menacingly in the air. These are moments that become hardwired into the brain, easy to recall and savor many years afterwards. So there is the glossy ibis. And also, I love the way you're reflecting about, you know, again, you are paying, you are wide awake in this moment, paying attention to, to light, the movement around you, the animals around you. And when we pay that kind of attention, the world just, these, these, these moments become so vivid in our, in our brains. Ah, that's wonderful. Um, in this photograph, you, uh, you can see some, yeah, all the, 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 the parts of the, the wing here, which, we're, which we study are all visible. This is, you're right, this is an absolute anatomy lesson. It's also a physics lesson. Notice how some of the feathers on the secondary coverts are lifting up, even casting shadows. What you're seeing there is um, turbulence formed behind the wing. That is an area of what's called drag. This bird has developed a little bubble of drag behind its uh, upper part of its secondaries. And that's what's causing those wings to, to lift up. And in response to that, it has put out its allula. So notice that the allula, the little bastard wing, that little um, wing right at the wrist, that is flipped up. That helps reduce drag across the back of the wing. Um, it's like flaps on an airplane. But um, this, this would be a, a, just a photograph to, to, to study and to draw and to draw again. Um, as you do each time, it's going to show you some other aspect, some other uh, bit of what you're, you're learning. But I want to just kind of go through this wing um, structurally, anatomically, and help us think about how I would get this down onto a piece of paper. When you're drawing something like this, it's easy to get initially lost in all the details and get a wing that may be accurate in details, but is totally out of proportion with the rest of the bird or out of position with the rest of the bird. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start with, uh, this is an, an excellent bird for us to end with. This is just so lovely. Um, I'm going to start with just a light gesture sketch um, of, of this bird. There's this, there's this arc. There's this arc of these wings. There's an upper wing that, oopsie, um, I have lost Peter's feed on my end. Ah, there it is. I've just reconnected. Right. So, so what I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, can so, you see it? yes, yes, yes. We've got it back. Bird is back. Um, so the bird's got a back in here. It's got a tail that it has turned towards us. We have this full view of this wing out here. Um, and then there is, um, the primaries, primary coverts, secondaries, allula, the little bastard wing. Um, it has a head. It is roughly up in here. Um, so now I'm going to look at a little bit of a negative shape underneath that throat. A negative shape behind the head. Now, let me, I'm going to use this sort of scribble drawing to block in 
major areas of plumage and kind of note what if I were to sort of slow down and make a more careful painting of this from that photograph, um, um, then, and remember, if you're ever using somebody's photograph to, um, to inform a painting, if you're going to be selling that or using it publicly in any way, you always want to get permission from the photograph from the photographer. Photographers are 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 are, are artists like we are, and we want to respect their intellectual property and their work. And you can actually you can build a partnership with it's then a then a partnership instead of something where you're 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 you're, you're taking without permission. So let's I'm going to start here close to the body and build out along this wing. And um, the, uh, so parts of that I find are really interesting. One is, I, you can see the scapular feathers making a really um, bold pad down the edge of the back here. So, You'll see the sort of edges of these 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 feathers towards the top, right? And then that pad that comes down, that is the scapular feathers. And you notice that the other side of the scapular feathers is coming out in the opposite direction. So they make kind of a wedge above which you sort of you see the rump of the bird sticking out and its um, upper tail coverts. Those those uh, feathers that are on top of its its tail, um, but getting there's that that nice sort of wedge of scapular. So that little zone in there, those are my scapular feathers. So very nice little structural feature that helps you kind of understand how the wing attaches onto the body, tuck in underneath those scapular feathers. Now. I have an area in here of s secondary coverts. So the secondary feathers are these ones that are kind of coming down in here. The secondary coverts are the ones that cover up um, the top edge of the wing. And you notice that there's several rows of them. There's a big row. Those are called greater secondary coverts. Then there is a medium row, those are middle secondary coverts, and then there are lesser secondary coverts. As you get in here, there's a whole bunch of rows of coverts. But um, at, at first, you've got these um, uh, as I'm putting in here, those are your greater secondary coverts. And notice that they sort of go in parallel with these um, with these uh, outer secondaries here. The secondary feathers come down from below those, and notice that the secondary feathers aren't actually all in parallel. The first ones are, but as you get closer to the body they start to angle in more towards the body. So in here, you've got some feathers that are pointing in this direction. And then as you come along this row, it starts to swing around and eventually becomes more parallel with the direction that you see those, the secondary coverts coming out. But in there's a change in angle in here. And I never got that in a lot of my early drawings. I would always have these all be parallel with each other. But very often you'll see these ones here, right where the ones that are kind of pointing in and attaching to the bird's elbow, at that point <clears throat> where your tertials are, those will often have a different angle. This little pad out here, that is your allula. And so there's a little pad of feathers. If this were not doing kind of some uh, sort of low speed um, uh, and uh, maneuver here, 
um, with its wings at a very steep angle of attack, so at, at wings at a very steep angle, that would probably, you wouldn't have all this turbulence here, and that would be smoothed down with the rest of the wing. Below that, you see there is par sort of mirroring what is coming up here with these secondary coverts. You've got this area in here of primary coverts. And so those fan just like the primaries fan. And in putting in this block of primary feathers, I'm going to note that the, the wing is going to come up. It's going to be come up in here. So I'm just sort of roughly blocking in its shape. Um, Notice that in this area out here in the tip of the wing, I can see more of a gap between individual feathers, but when I'm down here on the primaries, I'm not. So I'm going to have these be a little bit more fingered up in here and less so in here. And in addition to that, I'm going to, on these, the tips of these feathers up here, they're going to be bending up. So I have my feather coming in and I'm going to bend it up a little bit of a notch. The next one I bend up a little bit less of a notch. This one here, I bend up a little bit more and then we're getting kind of less notchy. But I, I'm, what I'm thinking about with each of these feathers is I want to think of it as kind of pointing in towards where the bird's hand is. All right, so less of a notch here, and then less here, and then we, we've got, we are kind of coming into this part here where we are. Um, no notches. But we're getting more notches in here, and also I'm clearly trying to make those ones kind of flip up. Those would be um, on that wing that is close to me. Those would be major things that I would be looking for to try to map in the structure of that wing. I want to point out just a little bit on the tail here. A few thoughts about that. Um, the tail is turned a little bit towards me. Um, and so thinking of where the midline of the back is and the midline of that tail is helpful. That means I've got the base of my secondaries here. I mean, of my, uh, of my, my uh, upper tail coverts here. And the bottom of the tail is going to be um, at 90 degrees to that. So if I've got my end of my tail coming around here, this part here, I want to kind of get that part to sort of flatten it around there. And then I'm going to turn this around here. I'm going to have this come up and turn into there. But that helps me kind of get the, the end of my tail. Um, I like to have that connection there, that, that part right in there, is a really useful part to, 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 to look for, to look at. Then the tail can, can fan around from there, but you want to make sure that, that that relationship between the midline and the base of your tail is going to be, is going to be solid. So, beautiful. Beautiful bird, um, and uh, also, again, just a magnificent lesson in anatomy. Um, thank you so much for sharing these with us. And um, if people are interested in, um, if, if folks are interested in um, getting a copy of this book, um, where can they find it?
I'm going to bring Peter in to join uh, it's me. It's on Amazon, John. So, it, yes, it's it's on Amazon. So um, you can just in Amazon type a hundred flying birds, and and you'll see it there. Right. Um, I hopefully, hopefully uh, in your local local bookstore. Excellent. I also want to send a a, a shout out. The the reason that you got on my radar um, is because of. Um, Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science, um, biologist, educator, and bird activist, um, said, uh, you know, Jack, have you seen this incredible new book um, about, uh, uh, with these incredible uh, in-flight photographs? So, Ann, thank you so much for um, getting Peter, Peter on our radar here. It's a fantastic book. It's just incredible photography and such a great resource. So I'm so glad that you connected. Absolutely. So because of you. Well, thank so, you, Anne, for making that connection. Good. Um, so uh, at, at this point, we've got, I'd like to just take a, a few minutes. If anybody has any questions um, uh, I, for, um, for, for Peter about uh, about his work, his photography, um, his thoughts about conservation, um, or whatever uh, is on your mind, you can use the raise hand function, um, and uh, we can put you on live with uh, Peter. You can also, uh, if you don't find the raise hand function on your computer, you can turn on your um, your your camera and just wave at me, and I'll see that you want to talk to Peter. Um, so does, uh, is there anyone who has a, uh, a, a question, um, a comment, uh, a thought, or an observation that you would like to share with our guest? I'm going to bring Ann Chadwick back on. Um, and you can now unmute Ann. You are live with Peter. Oh, wait, hold on a second. You're still muted. Uh, let's try that again. Try it. There, there, there we go. We. I think I unmuted then. Somebody muted. Anyway, here I am. Hi. Um, so I'm so sorry that I missed most of this session because I was in meetings with Point Blue Conservation Science and, uh, you know, trying to save the world. But um, I will definitely tune back in and look at the recording when it's ready. But um, I was wondering, Peter, is there some place that we can see your work? Uh, or do you have uh, displays in museums or um, anywhere that we can see it, other than the book? I, I don't have a permanent display, uh, Anne, but of course I do have uh, social media, and I have an Instagram account called Peter Cabana Birds. So if you were just on Instagram, you would find me. I also have a website which is petercavanagh.us and so uh, you could find me there. Mm -hmm. And you're based up in Seattle or the San Juan um, Islands? Uh, north of Seattle, yes I'm in the San Juan Islands. I'm on a small island called Lopez Island which is why my internet was so bad today. Um, we managed to survive DSL internet today so for the most part. Um, All right. So yes, it's uh, it's one of the San Juan Islands. There's about twelve hundred, about two thousand people live here uh, during the year, and uh, uh, double that during the summer. And it's a lovely place to live. So this is where I am when yeah. I'm not traveling. Great. I spend a lot of time. I'm in California at the moment. I'm in Sebastopol in Sonoma County, but I spend a lot of time up in Vancouver, BC. So. I love that part of the world, and maybe I'll find you on on Lopez sometime. <laughs> You'd be most welcome. You'd be most welcome. Great. So, um, and we really also just want to uh, thank you again for the work that you are doing on behalf of bird conservation worldwide. Um, and um, you know, uh, Peter, your your work also has a, a, a strong conservation value. It shows people the beauty of these animals um, as another. As, as an intrinsic reason for preserving and conserving them. Um, and thank you for, for that work as, as, as well. Yes, I'd like to think so. It's, it's very hard to, to reach uh, 
people who don't really, who haven't engaged about the tremendous loss that's going on. You know, we have lost billions of birds in the last couple of decades, as uh, yeah. I'm sure Anne will, will uh, can explain. But um, there is, it's hard not to become depressed by the constant barrage of bad conservation news. I, I don't know how you manage to keep your conservation spirits up, Anne, uh, in the presence of so much bad news. What, what, how do you do that? Well, that's a great question. And that's what I admire so much about the scientists who work on staff at Point Blue Conservation Science. We have 160 scientists on staff and I'm, I'm chair of the board of directors. So I'm a volunteer uh, leader of the board, but the scientists who, who are working day to day and doing these wonderful research projects with communities around the world, um, they manage to stay optimistic and feel like they're making a difference. Whereas I think, you know, if you sit back and think, oh, that's all hope is lost and there's nothing I can do and, and so on, I think you could get really you know, depressed and fall into a state of inactivity. But yes. I think because they are doing the research and they're doing the work, um, it actually keeps them optimistic and feeling like they're contributing to, to solutions. And yeah, we're taking a lot of spots. our... Sorry? I'm sorry, there, there are occasional bright spots, uh, as you say. And for example, I, some of you may have seen the... Uh, the the article by a very interesting woman who went to this island uh, between New Zealand and Antarctica. I think it was called Macquarie Island. It's where the Macquarie penguins are, anyway. And she uh, uh, Peter, uh, we've uh, just lost your connection. We lost you. You at she went to the, these islands and she. So let's. From there, we'll go from yes. Anshi. So she, uh, so, so she went there with her to eat any remaining vermin that were on the island. And she became so enthralled with it that she and conservation and joined the team who were working to preserve animals on that island. I, and I, I read that this week and found it just a tremendously uplifting story. I think we've lost your connection there uh, 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 again, but a tremendous. Sorry, I have lost. Uh, 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 <laughs> you're saying a tremendously uplifting story. Anne? And if, if you yes, want a similar uplifting story about uh, what we're doing on islands, you can look at what the what Point Blue is doing out on the Farallon Islands, which are just 17 miles off of San Francisco, and yet it's a whole different world out there. It's like the the Galapagos of California, and the the recovery of so many uh, both mammals and birds out there is just remarkable. I mean, you can find the statistics on our website and some great pictures too. But it's one of those success stories that keeps us going. That you know makes us see that we're actually making a positive difference. So we need those. Yeah, and, and another another piece in that is that. Um, passivity in the presence of of oppression of 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 injustice inactivity in the the, the presence of that um i think breeds despair and and pushes us further and further and further into ourselves but the minute we begin to come out of that shell and take action and begin to meet with other people and start to work together towards positive change. I think that that is something that gives us hope and energy and power. And um, so I th one reason I think that those, those, those researchers do not fall into despair is because they are actively engaged with, with, with doing something. But the, the uh, you know, forces who would want you to do nothing will tell you that there is nothing you can do. Um, but if we 
um, the, 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 you know, it's, it's like um, a, 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 a Vea Moore on her stewardship plots. She makes a difference in this place and that then raises her spirits and makes her fight for, for more things. The, the, the researchers who are out doing these sorts of things, they are kind of engaged um, by that action. And I think it, it holds off despair and empowers us. Um, I, I think that that's, that may be part of that. Um, Is I, I think another thing that, that I feel as a photographer is that I get to visit places that most people can sort of only dream about. Um, you know, I, stepping foot on uh, Beach, Georgia, where there are um, just an absolute uh, menagerie of uh, there. And to me, that is one of the great joys. I, I feel that uh, I am privileged to go to these places and being able to share them with others is, uh, it really just completes the joy of the, of the whole experience. Um, I, 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 I think it does. Um, we have, you know, going out and, and celebrating these, these wild places, sharing that with other people. Um, working together um, to protect and conserve these things. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's important work and the, the time for it is now. So thank you for bringing this beautiful book, uh, the celebration of biodiversity um, and just uh, joy and wonder. Um, uh, thank you so much for sharing that book with us. And I really appreciate you coming on and, and joining us today um, as, as, as our guest to, uh, to give us a, a, a little look into, into your work and, um, and, and your, your photography. Uh, we've added into the chat and we'll also add into the recording uh, description ways that people can find you and follow you online. Um, also want to encourage people to, you can find um, this book on Amazon.com or uh, perhaps uh, another way of getting that is to go to your local independent bookstore and um, if they don't have it on their shelves, ask them to order it for you. You give them the name of the book, they will order the book for you. It will take more time. It'll probably be a little bit more expensive than Amazon.com and it will be worth every penny. Um, because you're going to be supporting also your local business and 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 bookstore. Um, before we sign off today, um, Peter, are there any last um, thoughts uh, that you wanted to share with the community? Well, I, I just love the idea that these could also have a second life as uh, these photographs of uh, helping people like you and uh, the others on today to better represent birds in their painting drawings. Um, I'm actually married to an artist. She uh, uh, does not do figurative work. She has, but um, I understand just uh, what one goes through in uh, generating art. And, and I understand the passion of needing to paint and draw and uh, feeling that there is so much inside that one has to get out in a finite time. So. I really love the idea that some of you may use photographs in this book to help you in your work. So thank you for uh, giving me that opportunity to meet your uh, meet this particular audience. Absolutely. If people wanted to use um, those uh, some of your photographs as primary reference in an, an illustration, could they contact you and reach out to you for your 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 permission to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. And just remember folks, you know, photographers like us, we're, we are all artists and getting permission from uh, people to, to use their, their work as, as, uh, as a sort of significant resource. Um, 
especially if something is going to then be shared more broadly. Um, it's, it's part of what we do, not just as professional courtesy, but as um, to also just respect the, the copyright of, 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 of other established artists. Um, Peter, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I'm seeing a lot of thanks dropping into the chat. Um, and uh, now that it, uh, it's noon, we're going to be um, signing off. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much for being with us. And I greatly appreciate and respect your work. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.